You grew up in a small town in the north of France, in a working class family. And those are themes that, you know, come back in your books. Um, they're central to your work. Why? I mean, because I, I grew up in this context of an um, ancient uh, industrial town. It was a very small town in the north of France, where back in the 80s there was a factory where most of the people, most of the men would work at the factory, a few women. And then in the, in the 90s, this factory was, was uh, moved, was moved to, to Southeast Asia to exploit people there for the company to make more money. And the people in this town where I grew up suddenly became um, jobless mm. and penniless and hopeless. And um, I was the first to, in my family to escape this, this milieu, to escape this reality. And when I started to discover books, literature, movies, cinemas, journalism, I realized that nobody was talking about those people, that yeah. nobody was addressing those realities, those poverty. So for me to write those books was a kind of um, a fight against this uh, invisibility that we were suffering from and that we were repeating all day long. My mother was always saying, no one care about us, no one talk about us, no one, yes? Because it's in, in the book about your mother, you um, describe yourself and that's kind of hard to translate. So that's why I ask. You describe yourself as a transfuge de classe. Mm -hmm. What is that? <laughs> a class a transfuge is someone who, who moved from one class to the other class and has a kind of um, a, a bigger picture of society and of how it works. So yeah. for me, the question is always, what do you learn from, from that? What yeah. do you learn from that trajectory? What did of, you learn? What I learned, you know, is that the working class people, the poor people, are always suspected to be sustained by society. They're always suspected to get benefit from society. Mm. But it's the dominant class who have all the benefits, you know? They grow up and they have the culture, the parents give them books, they go to the cinema, they go to the movies, they know about the best universities, and, and, and they are prepared, and society is giving them everything to succeed. Yeah. And in succeeding, I mean having an easier life and having yeah. a better life. And, uh, and so it's the dominant class who gets the benefits, not the poor people who are starving, who are trying to survive, who are harassed by state to prove that they deserve to live, that they deserve to have a life. And so my struggle now is to show that reality is not what we think mm. and that the privileged are ob obviously on the dominant side of society. But was there one specific moment that you realized, because you're quite young when you moved to high school and then to university, obviously. Was there a moment you realized you were in between classes, that you were migrating? All the time. All the time. <laughs> it was happening all the time. I realized I didn't have the same childhood as the others. I never heard about books. I would spend my days when I was a kid in, in the supermarkets, you know, because we had access to nothing. And suddenly to be at the supermarket and to be surrounded by things we would never get, we would never be able to, mm. to have, would make us, would kind of make us dream. And I think maybe the bigger difference with the others when we were talking about uh, politics, and when I was talking about politics, they always thought that I was too nervous, that I was too violent, that I was too angry. And I realized it was because politics didn't mean anything for them. Mm. Because when you are privileged, when you have money, when you have diplomas, when you know people around you, you are kind of targeted by politics. Uh, you are kind of protected on the opposite. You are, you are kind of protected from politics. Mm. Politics is not really changing your life. But when I was a kid in this working class milieu, if a president, if a government was cutting welfare, was cut, cutting access to, to medicine and everything, you couldn't go to the doctor, you couldn't, you couldn't buy food. And so the more you are privileged and the more you are protected by, by politics. But for the working class, politics is a matter of life and death, yeah. you know? Yeah. When, when I was a kid, suddenly the, the, the French government of Sarkozy decided to cut the access to some medicine yeah. for poor people. And my father had a problem with his stomach and he couldn't fix it. But when you have money, when you have privilege, um, a government cannot destroy your stomach. But yeah. it, cannot, it can destroy the stomach of the working class people. Yeah. And so when you are poor, politics is part of your flesh, is part of your, of your body, and it's as intimate as your first kiss, as the first time you make love. It's, it's part of you. You cannot escape it. Yeah. And that is something that the dominant class has trouble understanding. They, yeah. don't, they don't see it. Another part is perhaps is if you migrate, um, you need to learn how to speak a new language. Um, 
And the sociologist uh, Per Bourdieu, which is, I understand, one of your favorite, mm. calls that the cultural capital. Mm -hmm. Was there one specific moment that you realized you didn't speak the language of your new class? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, kind of uh, discovering a, a new reality every day and feeling at odds. I was so ashamed of myself, of course, as, as many people who migrate from one class to the other. Mm. I had the impression I didn't talk well. I had the impression I was too loud. I had, I had the impression to be, you know, even in my childhood when we, when we would see uh, the doctor of the village mm. or the teacher of the village or the mayor of the village, we felt immediately humiliated because we had the impression that we didn't talk as well as them, that we didn't behave as well as them. We had the impression we had a too, bigger, a too big accent. Yeah. And so when you are a class transfuge, the question becomes, uh, did I become that body? Did I become that body to someone like my mother mm. or, my, or my father or my brother? When they see me, do they see what I used to see when I was mm -hmm. seeing the doctor or the teacher of the village? And it's a kind of situation that it's very hard to cope with. Do they? To deal with. Do they see you now as one of the people you used to look up to? <laughs> in a way, yes, I think. But in a way, I try to use the, the words of the dominant class. I try to use the tools of the dominant class, like Writing literature, yeah. in order to, to fight for them and to give, uh, to give yeah, a real representation of, of who they are. Because Previously, I was saying that working class people are invisible, but sometimes invisibility is not caused by silence. Sometimes invisibility is caused, is caused by words. Mm. And in the political field, there are so many people who talk about working class people, who talk about poor people. They're obsessed with them. They talk about them they every day. They talk about day. them, you mean? Yes, yeah, they, they say, oh, they are not brave enough, they don't work enough, they should do more effort, they should mm. work harder, they should work longer, or they get too much benefit. And there is, an, in fact, an obsession for poor people mm. in the political field, but in insulting them. And insulting them is making more them even more invisible because it's not they are what they are it's not what they are going through it's not what they are living and so invisibility is a tricky thing sometimes yeah. the more people talk about you and the more you are invisible and it's what is going on for most of the poor people yeah. in the, in the Netherlands in the USA and in France this book came out this week uh, it's a dialogue with uh, the director Ken Loach who is known for the film I Daniel Blake um, he make he makes work on the struggles of the lower classes as well um, and in this book, you describe how the lower classes go from being excluded from society to being um, persecuted. Um, and you just described what that meant for your father. Um, this year, the Dutch government resigned over the child benefits scandal. Um, and this week, actually, a documentary uh, appeared, Alleen tegen de staat. Uh, let's have a look at that. Die vernedering wat je op dat moment hebt, je bent nog steeds niet erkend uh, dat hun de fout bij hun liggen. En je krijgt een medewerker aan de telefoon die jou weer belachelijk loopt te maken. Jou weer niet gelooft. Um, eigenlijk doet of dat jij weer leugens aan het ophangen bent. Um, ja, het is gewoon pure vernedering. Hè? Vernederingen op de snelweg als politie je aan de kant haalt omdat je uh, je verzekering niet hebt kunnen betalen. De, ver de vernedering dat dat gas en water eigenlijk afgesloten moet worden. Um, de vernedering dat ze je op zwarte lijsten willen zetten voor een normale verzekering. Uh, de vernedering bij de psycholoog dat je je verhaal weer moet doen. Het is eigenlijk continu een vernedering. Yeah, we've showed you this clip before in translation and she talks about the constant humiliation she felt. What do you feel when you see this? Hungry, <laughs> outraged, um, because I, yeah, I know this reality, I've experienced this reality and I've experienced this kind of, yeah, a constant persecution of the working class people. This woman had to prove that she deserves to live, that she deserves to survive. The poor people, they have to give evidence and proofs all day long that they deserve an existence, mm. that they deserve a place on earth. And you know, in the book about my father, I, I, I described this situation when I, when I was a kid. My father had a, was a factory worker and he had an accident at the factory that mm. destroyed his body. He couldn't walk anymore, he couldn't breathe anymore for years. And um, he was on the welfare. And suddenly under Sarkozy, there was a new reform of the welfare. The welfare system changed. And suddenly the poor people had to prove that they deserved the welfare. They had to show that they were looking for work, that they were looking for jobs. And like this woman, they had to show that they deserved to live. Yeah. And I had, 
in a way, it's related to what I was saying before. I didn't have political memories of politics. I had intimate memories of politics. I remember the administration calling my father every day. I was seven years old, I was eight years old, telling him, you have to go back to work, you have to go back to work, you have to go back to work. So what does it mean? It means that the society, the government, and the dominant class say to the poor people, either you die, Mm. because we take the welfare from you, which is the subject of Ken Loach's movie, I, Daniel Blake, yes. or you die because you will go back to work, even if your body is destroyed by your life, by poverty, by your work. So it means either you die or you die. And that's the two options that we give to poor people nowadays in the Netherlands and, and everywhere else. Yeah, because in the book on your dad, you, you call out Macron and all the, all the politicians um, for persecuting these lower classes, as you say, do you think the same goes for our prime minister in the Netherlands? Yeah, clearly, clearly. And it's a, it, it becomes a paradox because um, the people who decide in politics uh, don't feel what politics means. Yeah. The ones who get to decide are not hit by politics. They are not crossed by politics. They don't know what, what it means. I could say the same thing for me today, you know? I'm a bourgeois. I'm writing books, I have a nice apartment in Paris, I studied, I've read Bourdieu, I do a book with Ken Loach, and Macron cannot kill me, he cannot destroy me, but he can destroy my father. Yeah. And how can you make politics better if the people who make politics don't know what politics means? Yeah. And it's, it's a call for revolution. My yeah. books are called for revolution, obviously. Is, is literature meant, do you think, for that kind of revolution? Yeah, I think that literature can can be this tool to kind of investigate a reality, to kind of reshape reality, to kind of um, put new words on reality. Because also that's the problem with the political field. The political field is always talking with abstraction, you know, the republic, the democracy, uh, the social bound. But politics is not about that. Politics is about poverty, domination, hierarchy, violence, humiliation. And where is life in the political discourse? I don't see life in the political right. discourse. And so that's why I'm trying to use literature in order to put, to put life in it, in the conversation. Can I ask you uh, for my last question? You just mentioned I'm now bourgeois and Macron cannot hit me. Uh, and you described have you, how you've migrated from one class to another. Does that mean that the class that you have now arrived at does that feel like you're home? No, <laughs> I'm, I don't feel at home and, and I don't want to feel at home. Mm. I want to use literature, I want to use this book about my father, or this book with Ken Loach, as a way to, to force the dominant class to see what they don't want to see. Because in, in a way we know everything. Mm. We know that the world is racist, we know that the world is unequal, we know that there is masculine domination. But most of the time, people are turning their head not to see it. Like when you go in the street, you see a homeless person and you turn your head. Mm. And so my books are here in order to, yeah, to force, force people, people to, to see, see it. Yeah. And that's, that's what literature should be, a source of confrontation. Yeah. Thank think. you so much Thank for your you. time and your Thank great you books. Bedankt voor het kijken. Vond je dit een goed gesprek? Vergeet je dan niet te abonneren. Een like of een reactie achterlaten kan natuurlijk ook. Of bekijk een van de andere interviews op dit kanaal.